Hey folks, today we have a video about this Sylvania stereo that I picked up in my recent thrift store scores video. Uh, I've been playing a little bit with this off camera and it has a lot of promise. It really does. Uh, so what I've done so far is I've just tested to make sure everything works. Uh, so let's start with the cassette decks. So they were really dirty and disgusting inside. One, so the, the balance, first of all, when listening to it wasn't right. And part of that was because these controls, these fader controls, were all dirty. So I sprayed all of them with CRC uh, control cleaner, just the cheap stuff you can get at Walmart for automotive use. Because, you know, this came from a thrift store. I'm not going to use expensive stuff on it. And that worked great. Now the balance is right. And this fader in particular was really dirty. I don't know why. So it was the base one. But they're all clean now. I sprayed them a few days ago. As far as the cassettes go, they both work. They both work great. Uh, the heads were a little bit dirty. The pinch rollers were absolutely disgusting in here. But they look great now, as you can see. Well, maybe not. But they look great inside now. I took the Westlife's advice, and I, uh, I used window cleaner to clean the capstan and the pinch roller. And I guess for the cap stand, it really doesn't make any difference. But for the pinch roller, it definitely did. Uh, pinch rollers tend to get a lot of just like dried, a dried layer of grease and crap on them. Window cleaner really cuts through the grease really well, and is not as aggressive as alcohol. So it actually cleans a lot better, uh, based on my experience cleaning these. So that's awesome. So everything works. Fast forward and rewind work. Play works. The record play switch is another thing I clean, so uh, overall I clean the contacts. I attempted to clean the function switch here. I don't know if I really did. Uh, clean these controls and I clean the record play switch, uh, which was extremely dirty, which was also causing some of the balance problems that I was hearing out of the uh, both cassette decks, mostly out of this one. So now I've got both of them sounding really, really good. Uh, radio works. The turntable does spin, which is nice. Uh, I One interesting thing is I took a look at this cartridge here. If you take a look at this cartridge, it looks very much like what you'd see on something like a Crosley Cruiser today. And uh, that's no accident. It actually is. Uh, except that this is a more genuine one. I took this cartridge off and took a look at it. Uh, the cartridge on this record player is a genuine Chiodenshi CZ800. So, this cartridge has been around for a very long time. I mean, if you look at the stereo, you can tell the stereo itself has been around a while, too. This thing is easily from the mid-80s, mid to late 80s, I would say. Uh, although the date codes inside didn't uh, don't really indicate that, and you'll see that later. Turntable spins. Cartridge works. Uh, when I got the turntable, all these connectors on the back of the cartridge here were all off the cartridge. I don't know why. They were all disconnected. So uh, I took the cartridge off, and it had a legend on the bottom of, on the top of it, actually. So I uh, was it on the top or the bottom. I can't remember. Anyway, uh, it had a legend printed on it, and I used that to connect the wires back. Uh, it's just left and right up top, and both grounds are on the bottom, so it was pretty easy to do. Uh, and uh, that was all put together and ready to go. And uh, <clears throat> that was the only part of this stereo that I was really uh, missing. I almost forgot to mention. I got this for $9.99 at Goodwill. Very cheap. These are the supplies I needed to, uh, for this video here. So, got a new stylus for this thing. The stylus is busted on that particular cartridge. Although I was able to put this in phono mode and rub the bottom and get sound. So the cartridge is alive, but the stylus is gone. And this thing uses RCAs for speaker output, so I got some cables. Starting up front, we have the dual cassette decks here. You have a high-speed dubbing button, so it'll do your high-speed dubbing. You have a basically a VU meter for how loud the sound is and you have both of these cassette decks. Looks like it uses permanent magnet erase and uh, as you can see I got it very clean in there. Here's the playback side. 
I got it pretty spiffy in there. So both both decks work. And I can't complain. Can't complain at all. This right side here is where the heart of the system really is. We have power light, we have FM stereo indicator there. Uh, we have bass, treble, and balance, and volume. So decent controls for a basic stereo, right? Microphones left and right for recording your own stuff. A quarter inch headphone jack. And of course your function selector switch, which gives you AM, FM, FM stereo, tape, and phono. So pretty straightforward there. And of course your tuning dial, which is entirely analog there with your uh, your whole band there. Here is the top, here's the record player. Now, if you're a viewer of the Westlife's channel, you might recognize this mechanism from his uh, video about Crosley mechanisms through the ages. I, f I forget what the exact video is called, but uh, it's basically a video about the history of the mechanisms used uh, from the 80s up until now. Uh, that you commonly find in Crosley and Victrola turntables. And this is one of the early examples of that. It's from the mid-80s, I would say. He had a mechanism from 1984, and this this has many similarities to that. It has the, uh, the clip that just holds the uh, tone arm in like that. So I would say this is... That would date this, turn, this turntable and this whole uh, stereo probably to the mid-80s, 85, 86 maybe especially with the styling on the front that we just saw. Uh, it has the Chua Denshi uh, CZ800 cartridge in it. As you can see, it's still quite dusty. I have not cleaned this up yet because I haven't tested anything yet, and that's what we're going to do in this video. Uh, so it does spin. I pl when I plugged it in, the thing does spin, so whether it's idler or belt, it's good. You have a built-in 45 adapter there, and you have up and down. Down is 33 and a third, and up is 45 RPM. And here you have a uh, a cubby hole for whatever, I guess, uh, just knickknacks and whatever else. I don't know what you would use that for, to be honest. Maybe uh, cassette storage? Yeah, that's probably cassette storage, actually. Let's test that theory. Yep, that is indeed cassette storage. That's really cool, actually. I like that. So you can probably store one, two, three, probably four or five cassettes in there. Not bad. Not bad at all. I think that's really cool. The back of the stereo does not really um, reveal anything important other than the, the caution, you're going to kill yourself if you open this, don't do it. And uh, the nameplate. It is a Sylvania SY1801. Uh, looks like it uses 20 watts from the wall, so maybe it's a 15 watt uh, amplifier in there. That's what my guess would be. Looks like it was distributed or made. No, it was made in Taiwan, Republic of China down there. But it looks like it was distributed by NAP Consumer Electronics Corporation in Knoxville, Tennessee. But is this thing locked up like Fort Knox? I don't think so. We'll f you'll see that later. Looks like this has a code number. I don't know if you can see that on the camera, but it's code number C601, whatever that means. 120 volts, 60 hertz. Now I'd like to show you what it looks like underneath. Before I take the bottom cover off, I wanted to show you these connectors here. There's an FM antenna connector, so you can connect an external one if you want, which is really cool. You don't always see that on these low-end stereos. And of course, there's 8-ohm speaker outputs in RCA form, so that's why I needed to buy those cables that I showed at the beginning of the video. Now. Let's take this masonite board off the bottom. And here we have the inside of everything. So I try to shine it with my flashlight here so you can see it. Uh, here's the heart of the machine. This is the record play switch that I had to clean. I put contact cleaner on both sides of it. You can still see kind of the shine on uh, one side there. <laughs> uh, yeah, there you have it. Pretty complicated uh, for a, uh, still pretty complicated and discreet considering it's, you know, mid 80s or so, would be my guess. There's your ferrite bar antenna down there. And this looks like the, um, looks like the FM tuner, or at least a tuning capacitor. 
Looks like right here you have a tuning capacitor. Uh, there's a resistor pack and some capacitors in there. Looks like everything is through hole in this, so if I had to fix it, it really wouldn't be that big of a deal. It's just a lot of small electrolytics. Which seem like they're still okay. Uh, looks like there's a lot of Elgin or Elgin brand capacitors in here. Uh, there are a couple of these chips in here. These uh, TA7640AP. And there's another one over here. A TA7668BP. So it'll be interesting to look up the data sheets and see what these actually do. Uh, looks like there's some adjustment pots there. Uh, anything else of interest? Looks like that's probably the amplifier chip there. Kind of hard to see what that is. I might be able to read it. There's a capacitor in the way, unfortunately. Yeah, I might just have to add this into the video after the fact or something. Let me move that capacitor out of the way. Okay, I moved it out of the way. It is a TA723 OP or 0P, something like that. I would guess that that's probably the amplifier chip because there's two little transistors in front of it, which are probably the drivers, the pre-drivers. Let me see if I can get a good angle of that. A uh, little bit difficult to get it, but yeah, there's visual proof of what that is. I, would, I, I think it's safe to say that's the amplifier chip just because it's heat synced. And now we can take a look at the rest of this. There's a, there's a lot of empty space in here, as you can see, just because, um, you know, they wanted it to look substantial and there needed to be room for the turntable as well. There's a nice power transformer there. This board here appears to just route power around. There's some uh, filtering on it as well. Uh, a couple of small caps there and a nice big one. So that's probably where your filtering stage is in the power supply there. You can see the wheel for the tuning dial hiding under there. Uh, what else we got? Here are the cassette mechanisms, and these look very similar to the mechanisms used in uh, V West Life's Sanyo stereo. I saw him make a video about repairing the pause feature of his, and uh, this looks very similar in construction. It uses Mabuchi motors and things like that. I wonder if they got these from the same supplier. I bet they did. As far as the belts go, they're intact and working, but they're kind of loose. So I have a feeling in, you know, a couple years I'm going to have to change these. Uh, hopefully I can find a belt kit for this. Uh, if anybody knows where you can get belt kits for these sort of Mabuchi motor type mechanisms, let me know. I, I'm, usually I find them on Amazon and eBay, but if anybody has specific knowledge, that would be awesome. Just stick that in the comments for both me and other people. Uh, so down here we have the, looks like the turntable motor. And if you peek down in there, you might just be able to see idler drive. Uh, I'm going to take the platter off the turntable so we can see that a little more clearly later. But you can just see it under there. And the rubber looks like it's in good shape. So I think we're lucky as far as that's concerned. You can see there's a micro switch here. Uh, that's what the turntable uses to start and stop the motor. And there you have it. That's the inside of this stereo. It is a cheap stereo, but it seems to be very serviceable. I think getting this whole chassis out might be a pain to get to those cassette motors, but uh, I think it's doable. As long as you don't have to restring the dial cord, <laughs> then uh, I think it's okay. Now here's a tag that confused me. This uh, Ching Ming <laughs> cabinet, it says 75114, which would lead me to believe January 14th, 1975. But I can't believe that. I somehow can't believe that. This thing has to be from the 80s. The design is probably a 70s leftover with new plastic to dress it up, is my guess. But uh, the this was definitely built in the 80s it had to have been i got to find another date code somewhere well it wouldn't be an old uh it wouldn't be an old stereo without a dead bug in it would it so i'll have to clean that out so i found that same date code from before on the bottom of this platter uh well similar date code it looks like january 18th 75 this can't be from 1975 there's no way 
I think the I think the mechanism and the design probably are, but the stereo itself has to be from the 80s. I mean, just look at it. It screams 80s. Like mid-80s. So, I think they're just recycling old designs and old parts and stuff. They have to be. So, yeah, anyway. Speaking of recycling old designs, take a look at that. It's an idler drive turntable, and it uses... Uh, two little poles to determine the speed there. Whenever I move one, goes to goes to one side, top, bottom. So that's very old fashioned. This is the way I'm used to things like dual turntables uh, working and things like that. And it looks like there's an auto return mechanism there, which is cool. And uh, yeah, I'm, what's the condition of the idler? I, this is the first time taking this off. Wow. That's a little bit hard, but it's still, it's definitely still rubber. So I think I got lucky. This rubber seems to be in pretty good shape. It's still fairly pliable and everything, so very cool. But yeah, there's the turntable mechanism. It's a fairly simple, old-fashioned design, at least old-fashioned by 80s terms. Here's the replacement stylus that I bought for the Truodenshi CZ800 cartridge. And... Uh, this, this works on many different turntables, including the modern Crosley ones. It's the cheaper of the styli, since it has a plastic cantilever, but it does have a diamond tip, which is what I was worried about. I got this for about $10, uh, which is why I picked it up, because it's a thrift store record player. I mean, who knows, if, uh, who knows how long it's going to last or if it's any good, but based on what I've seen, it looks like it's fine, so this might last me quite a while. Now, I've never seen this. On a cartridge, on a uh, not a cartridge, on a uh, stylus before. Warning: This item can expose you to chemicals including DEHP or lead, which is known to the state of California to cause cancer, birth defects, or other reproductive harm. So it's one of those Proposition 65 warnings. So I'm going to guess that's because there's solder involved in making these. I don't know, but it's mostly plastic, so that's very bizarre. Here's what it says on the back. There, that's how you spell Chuo Denshi, by the way. Right at the first line there. It is a diamond stylus, 0.7 mil, 3 to 5 grams, and it will do micro groove records. It will not do 78s. So you need a special stylus for that, but this record player does not support 78 anyway. So, first thing we're going to do is take the old stylus off, which just easily comes off. And as you can see, I don't know if you can see it, but the tip is completely gone on this one. So, but it looks like it's pretty much the same from the top there, so should fit just fine. A bit hard to do this on camera because it's just in the way and my hand is not cooperating with me today. There we go. New cart, new uh, stylus. Done. Done, done, done. Now I can throw this old thing away. What I'm hoping is that this Sylvania Stereo will basically replace what I've been using this Crosley Auto for. This is a pretty decent little uh, sound system, i got to say, but uh, the radio in it really leaves a lot to be desired, and the sound off of the turntable is a little bit shrill. Uh, I mean, it's good enough, it's fine, but the Sylvania is better, much better, as far as sound quality goes as I, when I tested it through headphones. So, probably going to put the Sylvania where this stereo is, and I don't know what I'm going to do with this. Put it somewhere else. But uh, the main draw for that is that the radio is much better. So, I'm going to put that up here, and we're going to give it a test. Alright, I have this thing hooked up to these RCA speakers here which are from the early 2000s, so they're not exactly period correct, but they do sound nice. So, why don't we give this thing a shot? Let's start with the radio. Hey, closing time. Wow, this thing picks up the classical and jazz station. That's good reception. And without much hash in the stereo. That's incredible. Most uh, radios where I live don't do that. 
deliver a lot of hay, ZipRecruiter finds you what you're looking for. See why four out of five. Well, start off with a lot of volume on the roadways, I-95, southbound slow into Churchman's Marsh with quite a bit of that activity coming in from 295 southbound. One and seven slow by the mall merging together down towards 273. Quite a bit of activity on Route 13 from Harris Corner down to Tybox Corner, as well as Route 40 through Bear. Yeah, there's your Philly traffic. Neiman's Road both directions at I-95 and the... Uh, she said, give me one up, what's up with that? Okay. Yeah, I mean, the benefit of taking it, and you may want to do some planning with an advisor, because this is a big decision, but just kind of some back of the envelope. People know that life never stops moving. Your electric and natural gas bills are adding up. Pico can help. Our financial assistance programs can help lower your monthly bills. This thing gets pretty good reception, I gotta say. Like, the fact that it gets the classical station is insane. Let's try AM. Tap, 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 tap. Man getting a whole lot of nothing on AM. That might just be because it's like there's bad weather outside today. I don't know. But yeah, uh, I did get AM stations when I tried this earlier, but I guess today is just not a good day for it. That's a shame. Well, on to the uh, cassette and record portion of the show. All right, on with the cassette portion of the show. As it turns out, this uh, stereo uses qu quite a linear power supply, as you saw, which means that the motor speed is heavily affected by the voltage that you put into the stereo. And my line voltage here runs a little high, so when I tested all this stuff before uh, going on camera, the speed was kind of high on the cassette decks and on the uh, record player as well. So what I had to do was get out my really crappy Chinese Variac and lower the voltage to the point where uh, it was normal. So then tapes and records play correctly now, which is exactly what I want. So um, now we can demonstrate the cassette portion correctly. So when I clean these out, they were filthy. Uh, and cleaning them out did improve the sound, so that's a good thing. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, actually, during the overview of the machine was these little holes below each cassette deck, under, above the rewind button there. These little holes here are where you stick a small screwdriver in to adjust the azimuth of each cassette deck, which I'm probably going to have to do to the play side. Speaking of the play side, I've noticed on these stereos that the play side tends to be the one that has the most sound issues, like dropouts or just sounding kind of muffled and crappy. Uh, and I think that's because most people use the play side uh, most of the time to play all their tapes. So, you know, it gets worn out the most. So, you know, just is what it is, I guess. Uh, so I'm going to demonstrate both decks. I have some very, very indie selections here. I have Unfound, which is sort of a synth wavy type synth wavy vapor wave type of thing kind of crosses both worlds hopefully uh these guys don't mind and they get a little exposure and uh here we go let's try anomaly one thing i wanted to point out is that this tape is really cool just just like looks like it's nuclear <laughs>
that's a really cool tape. So as you can see, the record deck sounds fine. Um, and I turned the bass up a little bit since that was sort of a synth wavy track. And uh, now we'll try the playback deck. I bid you greetings from the future. I had a copyright issue with that Vivian K vacuums tape that I was going to demonstrate in this side of the deck. So we're going to use something else. Slug Bug, Pointless Journey. Welcome to my room. Yeah, that deck seems to sound pretty good now, especially with a newer tape like that, so very cool. Back to your regularly scheduled timeline. Fast forward works on both decks, just fine. So does rewind, but one thing I notice is that fast forward and rewind don't really have an auto stop. It's only play that does, which I, I think that was fairly common for the time, actually. But it's just kind of annoying because if you're just laying a long tape rewind, you'd like it to just auto stop. But at least it does it on play. That's kind of the most important one for me because you, you know, you let a tape play, you don't want to touch it for a while. But as you can see, the cassette portion works well. I have not tried recording yet. We will do that a little bit later. Let's of course start with a little slug bug. This bad food album is fantastic. <laughs> have a little selection from Dan Mason off of his Void album which was just recently put on record. Oh, 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 
test the auto stop. Or the auto return, I guess. I think it's auto return. Wow, I guess that doesn't work. Huh. Maybe I have some more to fix on this record player yet. Can I trigger it? Yep. Yeah, it's just out of adjustment. So, auto return does work, it's just out of adjustment. Cool. Alright, let me switch it into 45 mode. And give a 45 a try. the auto return worked on the 45 and yeah, maybe it just needs to be exercised a little bit hey there you go well seeing as how the cassette decks play well the radio is great FM radio at least AM kind of hard to review that just because I'm not getting really reception from where this thing is which is a shame but I'm sure that's just due to weather conditions uh, record player sounds great I think the only thing left to do is to record so let's Let's find something to record and do that, shall we? I'm going to record a few selections from the radio, um, probably another cassette, and the turntable. I'll just do the B side of that winning lion, it's time to go, 45, that I played earlier. And we'll see how well the thing records. Let's check it out. Why? Why? Like, why, why, why does he win? It's not coincidence. Right, like no, it's, not, it's not coincidence. No, why? why? You know what? I always think because some people like like to think quarterbacks aren't a uh, wins aren't a quarterback stat, but I think they are over time. Like anyone for one year. The elections in Philly news. I have it on very good authority that there will be a Philly contestant on Jeopardy tonight. Tune in seven o'clock, six ABC. Right now it's WHY. Not a I'm Avi Wolfman here.
Well, as you can hear, the recording is very mixed, and I'm not sure if that's the machine or the tape, because I used a cheap on Walmart brand cassette. And as you can hear, during the radio portion and the dub from the cassette, the it seemed like the treble was just going in and out. It would muffle itself. But when I played that record, it was fine the whole way through. So recording seems to be very inconsistent, and I, I'm not sure that that has... I'm, I'm not sure this tape isn't just to, has to do with that or not. I have a feeling it probably is, because these tapes are not particularly high quality. So, that could just be the tape in this deck. But, as you can see, recording does work, although it seemed a little inconsistent there. So, maybe when I... I, I don't really plan on recording with this. I plan... maybe the radio. Maybe. But, uh, I mostly plan on playing cassettes back, so that's not such a big deal. That is a demonstration of this Sylvania stereo system. I can't remember the model number, but it'll be in the title. So, there you have it. Uh, very, very capable stereo system. It reminds me an awful lot of the Westlife's Sanyo stereo. This Sylvania one must share parts with it or something. It's like the cassette decks or something, because this thing is fantastic. It's what I would call cheap and cheerful. And paired with some uh, small bookshelf speakers like that, which were also a thrift store find, like, uh, God, must have been like a decade ago now. Um, works pretty well. It makes me wonder what the original speakers were like. They were probably very plasticky, just like the whole thing is here. But as you can see, a stereo like this, with a new stylus and clean um, pinch rollers and tape heads and stuff, and a pretty decent quality radio, very discreet looking components inside, could be surprisingly good, you know? Uh, th this was before the era where everything was on one chip. Uh, some stuff were on chips, but it wasn't literally the whole thing. So, generally the sound is going to be richer, better quality, all the above. This is definitely a cheap and cheerful uh, stereo system. One thing I should point out with these idler drives is you never want to leave them in 33 or 45 because it'll get flat spots in the in the uh, idler. So always put them to off when you're done using them. And with that, I'm done demonstrating this. So hope you enjoyed this video. If you'd like to reach me in social media, those links are down below, as well as our Discord chat. Have a good one, everybody. Ciao.